Welcome to BizTech's C-Suite Conversation Show, the show where we talk to business leaders about their businesses and how they and their teams help customers succeed. Today, we speak with Won Wenming, Vice President and Managing Director of Southeast Asia at UiPath. UiPath, which is listed on the New York Stock Exchange, was founded in 2005 and is headquartered in New York. It designs and develops robotic process automation software. Now, to tell us more about himself and the company, Wen Ming, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having us on the show. I'm, I'm delighted to share our views and perspective of this very exciting market called robotic process automation, or wider scale intelligent automation. Okay, um, tell us, tell us then, uh, you know, about UiPath and your history, because you're early in the game, 2005. It is. Um, so UiPath is founded by a gentleman called uh, Daniel Dings. Um, he first started working as a programmer in Microsoft, and, and he uncovered a very unique technique of computer vision, i.e. able to read all the events happening on the screen. And with that computer vision technique, he has evolved into building this organization to be a world-leading uh, robotic process automation. And I think we are we are fortunate to be blessed by various consulting firm uh, within the Magic Quadrant. And we had the opportunity to share uh, some of our technique uh, and um, intellectual property with the major clients here in Southeast Asia. Uh, we'll be keen to share some of the work we've done here. Uh, I look after Southeast Asia based in Singapore. Um, I've been here for coming to a year now, a very exciting year uh, that they've just gone through, uh, especially in the space of uh, intelligent automation, Brian. Okay, could you walk us through the evolution of robotic process automation? Uh, because now the industry mm. size, according to Forrester, has exploded to <laughs> 30 billion in 2024, and it will double that to about 60 billion in the next five years after that. Yes, indeed, the, the uh, annual compound growth rate is certainly very impressive. I guess this is a space that uh, also driven by, you know, the COVID situation that happened in the last two years, the economic development that's taking place globally, and every organization, and including individuals, is looking at ways to improve the lifestyle, improve the productivity, and improve the yield per whatever unit that the organization is measuring upon. And RPA is nothing simply than removing some of those monotonous, mundane tasks using the means of software robots to automate those processes. So the immediate reaction will be, oh, okay, well, I think that will bring a lot of happiness to employees exactly to the point it removes the mundane work and hopefully we could provide a better lifestyle and higher skill sets and ability to train them uh, to be of a higher um, uh, engagement from a strategy or business standpoint and leave the uh, mundane work to the software robots. Okay, so when we give us a perspective in terms of your product and services suites and what sort of industries really have adopted your software in Southeast Asia? That's a very good question, Brian. Um, I'll share with you where we first started and how it has grown to uh, other segment of the market. Um, in Southeast Asia, we are uh, fairly strong within the public sector. Uh, as you may know, public sector is, is a massive uh, area where a lot of documentation is taking place, and rightly so. Uh, second to public sector, it's the telecom industries. Just looking at billings or customer care or call center requirement that where there's a lot of uh, interaction. I think that's where robotic automation is able to assist the streamline of these processes end to end in a highly automated way. Uh, since we've been in Asia for about three and a half years now, certainly for Southeast Asia, we've expanded our coverage into financial services, especially insurance, mm -hmm. uh, manufacturing in the area of supply chain, and not to mention the new world of uh, digital platform, you know, the likes of the e-commerce platform, uh, where it links the front-end client interaction to the back-end supply chain, 
uh, where automation plays a beautiful role to make sure that it shortens the time to serve at the same time, improve the accuracy and, and client satisfaction uh, from that perspective, right? Okay, Wen Ming, in that case, give us some specific examples and use cases of how your customers have benefited. Now, you're all about improving productivity, cost savings, and increased efficiency. Give us some numbers around that. Yeah, so so that's the proof point, right? Um, I guess I started by sharing uh, the success we have in Singapore public sector. Uh, as you know, uh, Singapore government is all about improving yield, improving efficiency, and improving accuracy. So in the last two to three years, we've been working with various ministries and agencies with the intent of improving and streamlining processes. In return, the benefit to the ministries is almost close to about 5,000 man hours of savings from that perspective. Okay. And this is a stat that we just pulled out uh, towards end of last uh, calendar year. So that's one good example. Um, perhaps another example in the space of uh, telecommunications would be Starhub. Uh, and, and this are published information, and uh, we were very pleased to be with Starhub to look at how do we reduce their reporting time by 90%. So instead of hours it takes to generate certain report, it's now down to minutes uh, of generating the reports. And you could see the benefit of uh, that reduced uh, time to serve uh, as it translates to high accuracy and higher employee satisfaction too, because they don't have to go down to every tables to extract information manually. It's all done uh, by a software robots, uh, Brian. Now, you know, we've got a labor crunch in Singapore right now. Mm -hmm. um, and in some other markets as well in the region, how can automation address the labor crunch facing organizations today? Yeah, Brian, that's, that's a, a real um, impact to our society today. Uh, you know, a few quarters ago, we've been reading about the great resonation happening mm -hmm. somewhere beyond Asia. We thought, oh, no, you'll never happen here. But it's coming over and it's happening right now. In fact, uh, we've just conducted a survey. Uh, we call it the uh, 2022 Office Worker Survey that mm -hmm. we have um, uh, embarked on that journey. And, and the results was quite frightening, though. I'll give you some stats. 48% of the survey done, and this are only done in Singapore, and we've got data by different countries, but 48% of uh, participants that we surveyed has expressed intention to leave the job and look for a new job in the next six months. 48%. Now, that's scary, right? Yeah. Um, now, a, a tag-on question was, well, if 48 is looking for a new job, how about the rest of the participants? And it's a bit more scary where it says that because of the effect of the first wave, two thirds of the rest are fearful now because they're under a lot of stress, the fact that their colleague may have moved on. So the question is, under such a democratic environment, how could RPA assist in lifting the employee job satisfaction. And uh, the survey clearly shows that the segment of the employee market where it deals with a lot of data crunching, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, reporting work, is where the attrition rate is highest. So therefore, we felt that by positioning RPA in this space to reduce the amount of man effort required to do the mundane work, would then improve the job satisfaction of the employee in the space of the employment. I want to give a counter argument to that because Please. there is a lot of fear that robots and robotic process automation will displace millions mm -hmm. of jobs around the world. Mm -hmm. Now, leaving in its trail, mass unemployment and debates like this have grown on a global scale. Mm -hmm. How can we ensure that technology augments, as you are alluding to, and not replaces human capabilities in the future of work. Yeah, that's, that's a, uh, a very uh, scary and frightening trend that say, hey, 
will bots be ultimately replace human beings? <laughs> the answer is actually not. Uh, what we have seen, and uh, in fact, even in Singapore, um, we have developed the technology such that it's easily deployable by employee that doesn't have IT. So it's a no code or low code sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely spot on. The no code, low code is hitting our shore, is hitting our platform that you and I, in fact, myself, uh, my background was managed services, professional services, infrastructure. You're a techie. Right? Yeah. I, I, I'm a techie. <laughs> but, I'm uh, not, I, mean, I love technology. I love technology. I'm so glad I'm not a doctor, but uh, that's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> but technology allow us to, to drive innovation. Um, in this case, uh, we make the robotic process development uh, to be a graphical interface tool. Uh, by making it easy to, to develop a bot, we can now expand the knowledge and skill sets to a much wider uh, audience. I'll give an example. Uh, in a recent um, uh, engagement we have with uh, a ministry in, in Singapore, uh, what they have done was they adopted a program we brand as citizen development. By, by sure name of citizen development is all about uh, reaching out to everybody in the organization so that you could build a bot on your own using graphical uh, user interface. And we've got success cases where there are um, players about my age, like late 50s, <laughs> with no IT background, is able to use boards, develop boards, and build boards to replace some of the work they're doing, be it email responses or client satisfaction survey or data crunching. And guess what? That, that gives them a much higher level of satisfaction in what they're doing rather than the mundane work that they, they used to do. So I think to answer your question, uh, the notion of bots replacing human, I will rephrase that. I would say bots will enhance humans' presence. In fact, allow you to enhance yourself to engage in the highest skill set uh, work that the organization could uh, cater for you and leave the monotonous work uh, to the robot to do it 24 by hours without sleeping. So, well, the thing is, so UI path is... Uh, obviously in a hot space right now. What's the direction for UiPath in Southeast Asia in 2022-2023? Hmm. So uh, moving forward for the next two to three years, what we've realized is the demand created with the whole transformational exercise and hence resulted in a demand of RPA and intelligent automation. There is sudden shortage of skill sets in this space. So therefore, uh, UiPath, we have consciously developed various programs, including academic alliances, where we embed our technology and know-how into the curriculum of the Institute of Higher Learnings, okay. the polytechnics, the universities, because we believe we can embed that to the next level of students graduating from school, be it business or technology, regardless, they will be able to come out fully equipped to address to the needs of the industry. So I, I think apart from creating the awareness and know-how of how inter intelligent of automation could assist in the business, the groundswell of skill sets availability to cope with the demand uh, created as a result of the needs in the business is equally, or if not even more important, to ensure as an organization, as a country, as a community, we're heading in the same direction. Now, Wen Ming, um, I want to zoom in on you now. <laughs> now, you were in NTT for almost 26 years prior to joining UiPath. And that's a very long time in the tech space to be in one company. It is. And obviously, you, 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 your whole career developed there, literally from a junior right up to, to, to running the business across the region. Now, share with us some key lessons that you learned in management that you picked up at NTT that UiPath and your team 
and UiPath has been able to benefit from. Thanks, Brian. Yes, uh, when I first started uh, with a company called Datacraft Asia back in 1995. I'm old enough, I know Datacraft. <laughs> <laughs> so when I mentioned Datacraft, I said, oh my goodness, really? So from Datacraft, you evolved to Dimension Data and subsequently NTT acquired Dimension Data. And yes, 26 years is, uh, is the length of uh, engagement I had with the organization. And I've learned a lot. I've learned tremendous. And shifting to UiPath, uh, one thing I'm really excited with is the audience I'm talking to right now, it's, it's beyond technology. It's beyond infrastructure. In fact, the dialogue is mainly with a CFO, HR director, or a CEO about how can we improve either the top line from a, uh, a revenue generating standpoint or uh, a bottom line uh, cost uh, optimization efficiency discussion. So I, I, I'm delighted. And, and I think those learnings in the days of uh, tech uh, allow us to be able to articulate the entire end to end automation uh, in a more um, uh, easily understood uh, fashion, uh, simply because uh, intelligent automation starts from an end to an end process rather than just the infrastructure side. So coming on board uh, to this organization for about a year now, working with all the various um, uh, team members, especially the uh, value engineering team, it's all about translating how automation could bring value to various industries, various domains uh, in a, a business relevant conversation. So that, that excites me, that excites uh, the entire team, and that excites our clients' conversation with us as well. Now, when we, the other thing that also struck me is the fact that when I saw your, your background and I researched your background, you essentially went through three different cultures. Yeah. Because essentially you have a Japanese culture, you had the, <laughs> the with, with Dimension Data, it was the South African culture as well. So how did you what do you think the lessons that you could learn in terms of integration, perhaps for management, integration, especially cultural integration, hmm. um, that perhaps you could share with, with our audience? Yeah, so if, if you look at the, the Japanese way of accuracy on time and perfection, coupled with the South African way of friendliness, and it's dimension data way of a startup, passionate about success, I think picking various um, uh, success attributes and put it together, and, and <laughs> I, 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 will, I will confess this, when I first joined UiPath, I'm probably the eldest among the team. They are all, <laughs> they are very early stage, right? So, so I, I, I'm excited because working with a team of uh, energetic, super energetic, highly energized team allowed me and us to exchange cultural values so that we're heading in the same direction. I had the privilege of uh, meeting the founder of uh, UiPath, uh, Daniel Denise, uh, just two weeks ago when he was in Singapore. Uh, he too shared uh, exactly to your point, it is culture of the organization that makes a team successful. You got the right culture, you got the right dynamics, you got the right, you know, that spirit to win and working with the client, I think that's where things will fall in line and success will be leading this way. Wen Wing, I've really enjoyed this conversation, but before we leave, any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, so I would uh, extend uh, the invitation to everybody on the call. Uh, please embrace intelligent automation, be it at home, in the office, for your business colleague, for your CFO, or even your PA to assist the job. It's all about making life slightly more comfortable than doing some of this monotonous work that we never like. So I thank you for the opportunity, Brian. This is uh, a great conversation. I really enjoy it. And I thank you for the opportunity. Now, thanks for taking your time to be on the show, Wen Ming. I'm Brian Fernandez, and we've been speaking to Wan Wen Ming, the Vice President and Managing Director of Southeast Asia for at UiPath on BizTech's C-Suite Conversation Show. This video and podcast will be on our website, www.biztech.asia, 
as well as our social media platforms, as well as third party streaming and uh, traditional media platforms. Please subscribe and like our various platforms. Thank you very much for tuning in.